Kevin Kelly, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, it's really an honor. And not only because you've had a huge influence on me directly, but also indirectly, because many of the people that I admire that I've learned from all cite you as an influence. So thank you for being such a well-connected node in the network. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And thank you for inviting me. It's going to be fun. I want to begin by talking about your, your new book, which is called Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier. I was lucky enough to get an advanced copy. I've read it. I've really enjoyed it. And to give a, an idea to the listener, it may be the equivalent of two tweets per page, but I may spend five or ten minutes on the page thinking about it, telling my wife to come over and then we'll discuss it. And it's a great reminder that quality is much more important than quality. I really admire your talent for compressing ideas. Eugene Wee has a great piece called Compress to Impress, but I, I prefer his alternate title. You can see it in the slug in the URL. It's JPEG for your ideas. And I'm <laughs> curious what you think about this, right? This talent for compressing ideas, is it so important at being like effective in life? It feels to me like the ideas travel more and stick in people's mind. And can this be taught or it, I'm curious how you got there? Wow. There's a lot of questions there. One is I had not heard of that little phrase, which I love because itself is a compression. But yes, this is exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to take a whole book of wisdom and compress it into a little proverb, a little maxim, a little adage. And I think what happens when you do that, there are two things why that's an advantage. One is that it's easy for me to remember, so I can repeat it to myself to change my behavior. It's very memorable if it's really short. And then secondly, it transmits very well. It communicates. It can go viral. It can speed along. It can be communicated to others really well. So that compression is something that I work on. And that is where most of the energy to the book was trying to say, can I make this even shorter? Is there some way to compress this further? Is there some way to compress it in a way that's easy to unpack? Can it be taught? Can this compression be taught? I believe that everything can be taught in the sense that even though there's levels of difference between our natural abilities, we can all make something better. We can always get better at something. We can always improve. And so in that sense, it can be taught. I will never be a basketball player, but I could be a little bit better in basketball than I am. So compressing is, I'm sure, a skill that can be taught. And some people are probably better at it than others. I tend to naturally want to compress. I write very telegraphically anyway. So I think this worked to my advantage because I like to write in a very succinct way. It made me wonder if we inverse kind of the idea, are many great ideas out there, but they're in some obscure book somewhere that nobody has read because it's so impenetrable and, and hard to read. And maybe is it something that AI can help us with, right? Not teach us new things, but find existing ideas that nobody has found anywhere and kind of recompress them, reframe them in a more digestible format. I haven't yet tried it, but ChatGP just expanded the number of words that you can put into it, and I'm going to train it on my book and ask it to generate new aphorisms in my style. In other words, I'll take a text and say, compress this in the style of Kevin Kelly and see what it does. And it may, who knows, you're right, it may be something that AI is very good at. Yeah, and the interesting thing is that AI seems to be good at extracting the style of someone, right? Visually or still, but then you can make hybrids, right? What's the style of Kevin Kelly and Mark Twain, right? Together, that doesn't exist right now, but this could be interesting to find out. That's the genius of all the AI generative, both image and in text, is this ability to do something hybrid in between the white spaces, cross disciplinary and stuff. And humans can do that. But it takes such a dedicated mastery of both the sides and then to be able to integrate them into something new so that we do that in a very kind of precious way. I mean, it would be like a PhD level <laughs> assignment. It would, be, it would be a huge project to do it. But AIs can do that within seconds and they can just throw them off, numbers of them. And so they do it very, very fast and very cheaply. It's sort of like We had librarians who could find things in the library before there were computers. They could find something, but it was just so laborious. But then we have a Google search and we just search things in seconds and we, we waste the searches. We search for things that normally would be very expensive to search. And so the same thing, this hybridization, this in-between is something humans can do, but we can't do it fast compared to what the AIs do. And that's 
the real service that we're getting now from AI is this ability to do this for free. And I think it's really, really powerful. I have a theory about that. I'm curious what you think of it. I think when it comes to these generative AIs for art, I think they're unbundling creation. You used to need a bundle of having the ideas, right? So you need to know what to do and then know how to do it. So you need the techniques to paint or sculpt or whatever. And now a bunch of people with ideas, but not enough skills to do it can still execute. But this old bundle meant that stylistically, if it takes you 15 years to become a sculptor, some stuff transfers, but not everything. So you won't start from scratch and become a painter or whatever. But now I wonder if we'll have a lot more stylistic fluidity, right? Some artists with great ideas will execute them in many, many mediums. And this could be a new thing. Yeah. Good way you think of the kind of the prompters, which are the new artists, is that they're like directors of a film. They're commanding a whole bunch of different entities and agencies that do the craft. And their craft is orchestrating creative ideas and they have crafts people who do the cinematography and do the music the score and, and everything and they're kind of curating or directing the thing or a producer in music so we now have that kind of on images and the important thing is that enables many more people to participate in creativity and i say we have synthetic creativity these these engines are absolutely 100 lowercase creative. They are creative. There's no getting around it. We can't deny it. But it's a lowercase, small c creativity. It's not the uppercase creativity that we have, like with a Guernica painting or Picasso or something. So the idea is, is that those we, we can't synthesize yet, maybe someday, but not right now. And so that lowercase creativity is synthesized and it's available to people. And that's a huge innovation. Back to the book, I'd love to share some of my favorite passages, and then we can maybe uncompress them a little bit and know what was behind. One I love is you write, the fact that you can't do something can be embarrassing, but if you are learning to do something, that is admirable. And it reminds me a bit of Carol Dweck's like growth mindset versus fixed mindset. And this feels like the kind of life unlock that if someone can learn that young enough, the whole trajectory of their life can be totally different, right? Right. I mean, it would be like, you say, I can't swim. That's kind of embarrassing. I'm learning to swim, that's admirable. And if you're trying and just taking little baby steps, that's all you need. You feel like you made the change in your life at some point or were you always of the, I'm just learning, I can do it if I put effort into it? Yeah, I have been a lifelong learner. I don't know why. It's interesting because I hated school in a certain sense. I hated homework. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I was the kid who sat up in the front row of class and asked questions all day. And then when I left the classroom, I did nothing more. I, like, I, did, I was done. So like, I was totally present in the classroom, but I didn't do the homework. And so that was not a very good way to study. But I've been a lifelong learner. And this idea of, as I said before, I think we have natural talents that vary tremendously, but we can all improve in whatever it is. So I can't sing, but I can be learning to sing. And so that's a huge alteration of the frame of your life. And so I don't think we're obliged to master everything or to even like everything. There's just too many choices in the world, and that's a good thing. But we have no obligation to use everything. So I think we can be very, very selective. But I think people are better when they try things. And even if you I've tried something once to go back and try it again, just to be sure that you're not missing something. My son, we exposed him to computers and stuff early on. He was never interested. And then all of a sudden at 25, he decided he wanted to be a programmer and kind of came back to it. So it's worth going back and trying things that you didn't like earlier when you were younger and the world can change, you can change. So I'm a believer in that you don't need to be using everything, but you need to keep trying things. Right. And I think that's a rich vein, right? The education system that was kind of designed in the, this industrial age where you needed people to operate the machines. And so you try to turn the people into machines. But how can we get out of that right now? Right. One of the things you talk about that I love is the idea of, you know, you need slack to have creativity. You need some yes. time to think. And the whole civilization is not built for that right now. But we could get so much out of it if we could simply change that model. But I don't know how we get away from... Well 
I think AI is going to help us because the thing about computers and robots is that they are geared to productivity. And I say that any job that you're measuring with a productivity metric is a job a human should not be doing. So productivity is for robots. What humans are really good at are inefficiencies, jobs that are inefficient. And where are some inefficient jobs? Well, scientists. It's a hugely inefficient process. If you're not making mistakes, if you have experiments that don't fail, you're not learning. So failure, things not working, is how science works, how science progresses. Innovation, entrepreneurship, inherently inefficient process. You have to make prototypes. You have to go along dead ends. You have to pivot, all those kind of stuff. That's all inefficient. Exploration, we love exploration. That's inherently, it's about dead ends and detours, turning back. It's in, hugely inefficient. Art, hugely inefficient. Nobody is talking about you know, the number of paintings per hour that Picasso is making. <laughs> it's about the most inefficient thing possible. And if an artist produced one great thing a year, we would actually be more satisfied than if they produced 100 mediocre paintings a year. So basically, if we have anything where productivity is a concern, it should go to AIs and robots because they're really good at that. And what we're going to be left with are all the things where there's inefficiency, including small chat, including hospital care and other kind of care where we are just spending time with other humans. That's very inefficient. Right now, what we're doing right now is very inefficient. <laughs> yeah, we could transfer a binary file with all the info in a second. Right, right. It's really inefficient, but this is what we love, and this is what we're going to optimize, and we're going to let the robots do their productivity. And speaking of compressing ideas, I've heard you say that as care advice for someone young, it's right to find something for which there's not a word yet. You can't describe what it is. And in the book, that would be compressed as, don't be the best, be the only. This reminds me of a novel as a way of saying it, which is escape competition through authenticity, right? If someone else is doing the exact same thing, well, maybe a robot can do it, right? Exactly. That's another piece of advice in the book is that if your views on one matter can be predicted from your views on another matter, you should examine yourself because you may be in a grip of an ideologue. And what you actually want is you actually want to have a life and views that are not predictable by your previous ones. And the advantage there is that you are going to be less replaceable by an AI. Hmm, yeah, if everybody's thinking the same, a lot of people are not thinking in there. Well, but the AIs are autocomplete. They're just kind of autocompleting. And if you're easy to autocomplete, you're easy to be replaced. That's a good way to put it. Optimize for being hard to autocomplete. Yes, exactly. A different one from the book that I love. You talk about the, how we lack rites of passage. Create memorable family ceremony when your child reach adulthood. I have two young boys and I've been thinking about this, right? And it, it's so true. I feel I've lacked this in my own life. And now I'm trying to design this in the life of my children. And I'm curious about how have you implemented this in your family? Have you seen this in people around you? Like any good examples or any ideas we can spread today, right? I also say that another related piece of advice is that you should make as many rituals in your family as possible. Make them easy and make them abundant. And if you repeat something three times in a row, that's a ritual. The main ingredient, the main thing you're trying to get is you want your kids to anticipate these, to have anticipation. If they anticipate it, it's a ritual. But what the ritual gives them is this anchoring, this sense of, of grounding, something they can depend on. It's that reliability that they really crave. And when they're reminded by this, it gives them a deep anchoring that helps them in their life because they know. So like for our family, for entire time the kids were there, 20 years, we had pancakes every Sunday morning, no matter what. I cook pancakes. It's like a silly thing. It's like nothing. But that becomes this ritual. That becomes something our family does. That becomes part of their identity. This is what we do. And they can rely on that. And they know the rest of the world may be going crazy, but we're going to have pancakes on Sunday morning. And I have a friend I just visited in Austin, and they do pizza night every Friday night, no matter what. It's pizza night and movies. And it's like the rest of the week could be really tough, but they are going to have their pizza There's food things, there's weekly things, there's Sabbaths where lots of families, 
take a Sabbath, and I really advocate technological Sabbaths, and people who practice that are very, very happy where you have no screens for 24 hours. And it's amazing what happens when you do that. Just no screens for 24 hours every week, the entire family together. Boom, it's just fantastic. So this idea of having rituals is very important, but there's also, besides weekly ones or monthlies or seasonal, there's also rites of passage in terms of age. And one of the things that our culture, the American culture lacks is a rite of passage into adulthood. Many other cultures have them, they're very common. We don't have one, so we invented one for our own family. They're now all older than 21. So we picked 21 as the day. You could take 18 if you wanted. We took 21, and the ceremony that all three kids shared was we took red ribbon, and we tied a ribbon around my wife's and our waist, and then we had a, a red ribbon to their waist, the child who was uh, graduating, and we tied a red ribbon around their waist, and then we took his scissors, and we ceremonially cut the cord, cut the umbilical cord, cut the red ribbon connecting us, then they had their first legal drink, a toast with wine, their first legal drink. And then we gave them two checks. But one of the checks was their last check. It was like, okay, you're on your own now. Here's what it is. Here's the last bit that we're going to give you. You're kind of on your own. And there was another check for some of the kids because we had made a wager or bet or promise that if they didn't smoke or drink until they're 21, they could get $1,000 which was something I did when I was growing up with my dad. So that was what that was about. Although I only got $100, but... <laughs> <laughs> Inflation. <laughs> Inflation. But anyway, they had other ceremonies. And so another example is my son, when he was 21, he wanted the family and friends to take some edible paper with edible ink and write their advice to him, which he then read and then ate. Oh, wow. He consumed like communion consume their advice. I thought that was brilliant. That was his idea. And then the other thing he did was we lived near the ocean. He said he wanted to go down to the beach and he wanted to run into the ocean as a boy and walk out as a man. Wow, that's powerful. That's amazing. So that's what he did. My older daughter wanted to get baptized in our hot tub and she had some other things. And my other daughter wanted to bake bread and feed everybody the bread that she baked. And so there was just these little lovely things that the kids came up with to mark their, their passage into adulthood. And those kinds of ceremonies are just something that become very important to the family. And that, that's the larger bit of advice for me is that treating the family as a unit and talking about family happiness and talking about ways in which you can strengthen the identity of children to the family, the more that they can identify with that family – the more rooted and anchoring it becomes. Mm. I love it. The, the symbolism is great, and it's a lifetime memory for sure for them. And something you said kind of unlocked the idea for me, right? I don't think I was thinking about it right, but when you mention the anticipation is important, it's not something you should spring on them at the last second and like, congrats, now you're this, and let's do the ceremony. It should be known in advance, and you move towards it, and it's on the horizon, and that makes it work. I can totally see it now. And even the little things, like, you know, on the solstice. Our family does something on the solstice. Every year we will do something, and they're kind of looking forward to this thing, dance around the maypole or we light candles, whatever it is. Again, it doesn't have to be big or laborious, but just having the anticipation that we're going to do this. Some people have the same vacation home that they go to every year. It's the same thing. We go to this, and we have it there, and we know the house, and that anticipation is... Very satisfying. Right. It's a lot of things that when you see them, they felt right, but I didn't know why. And now I think I can put words into them. That's great. One more that I love, uh, you write, anything real begins with the fiction of what it could be. Imagination is therefore the more potent force in the universe. It's the one skill in life that benefits from ignoring what everyone else knows. I strongly believe that humanity in general is limited not by talent, but by vision, right? We need these dream generators that create all these dreams and then people can follow them. But we have a scarcity of that. And I don't know how we can get better at it. How can we spread that skill or grow it? Or I don't know but if you have any suggestions. Well, I think it becomes like anything else. It's a skill that you can improve. And I think we can 
teach it more in school. And I think we have a culture that has been increasingly rewarding that, and that's really good. But I also think, by the way, I think the AI will help us. The AIs will help us because they think differently. That's the whole point of them is they do not think like humans. They're kind of weirdly alien. And that's not a bug, that's a feature. And so we'll work with them to help us come up with ideas and imagine things that we would have difficulty imagining ourselves. And that's the people who are using these image generators is just the beginning. And that's very much in that line of like coming up with things that they wouldn't ever come up by themselves, but together with these, um, I call universal personal interns, UPIs, that together they can come up with something that is imaginative, that is different from everybody else. And that, you're right, is I think if we imagine a civilization a thousand years from now, whether it's our civilization or another one, we're going to be able to synthesize most materials, most things, right, if you have all this stuff. And so what is the one thing that would be scarce in the universe? And there'll be ideas, concepts that are just really hard to get to, and you might need thousands of different kind of AIs working together to actually reach this idea. And that will be the scarcity. The scarcity will be novel ideas. And that includes like scientific ideas as well as, you know, art ideas, whatever it is. They're going to be increasingly hard to get to, meaning that hard to get to where someone else hasn't already gotten to. And like science, I think there's going to just require more and more help to imagine things that everybody else hasn't already imagined. Yeah, it makes me wonder if some of these ideas that we'll get to with AI tools, will we get to a point where they can translate back to our human brains, right? If the AI can get to the idea by thinking in the 60,000 dimensions and, and seeing some weird shapes of things, but can it translate it back to us in a language that we can understand, that we can hold in our meat brains with limited short-term memory and all that, right? I think we could imagine the AIs working with other AIs, working with us, making a discovery in science that we don't understand. Mm. It's kind of like magic to us, right? Even if you can read the proof that is 50,000 pages, but it's still too hard for us. Right. So we have that already. We have computer proofs where humans just can't put it into our buffer. We just can't load it in. And so we have to rely on them in some ways. Do we trust them for this proof? And I think there'll be more of that. There'll be more of that, whether there'll be some discovery or invention that we don't fully understand, which is okay, because we don't understand how our own minds work, and we use them all the time. So we don't actually require understanding everything to use them. It's better if we could understand it, but we don't actually require it. So if we met another alien, we worked with another alien, and we may not understand how they exactly their mind worked either, but they can still be useful to us. I think we're going to learn that we can use things without fully understanding them. Right. I think if we zoom out right now, for most people, most things they use every day is de facto magic, right? A smartphone, a, I think they know someone somewhere knows how it works, but they're pretty far from that. And we may get to the level where we know that no one anywhere understands it, but it still works and it's fine. <laughs> I don't know. For thousands of years, we used wood and trees, and we didn't know how they worked. We didn't know what, actually, scientifically, what was going on, and they were perfectly useful. So we, we have evidence that we're comfortable using things that we don't understand. One more, a different one. I love this one, too, is when you're young, have friends who are older, and when you're old, have friends who are younger. And I have an, a different thing I wrote about this, about how like our society has a blind spot for age segregation. And I often ask the question on, on Twitter or something like, can you think of a time when you had a conversation with someone for more than five minutes who's a generation older or younger than you are, right? Let's say 20 years, who's not a family member and it wasn't a commercial transaction, right? Someone at the bank or whatever, right? Just a real conversation with a real friend that's not family. And there are very few. It, it seems like society is, is, all the kids are hanging together, the parents, and the only time you meet people is within your own family or a group. And that feels wrong, right? That feels bad. I don't know how to change it, but... It's not, not hard to change at all, really. I mean, that's easy. So, like, I like to go to conferences and things where there's lots of young people and hear what they're interested in. It's a good assignment that's actually not hard to do. 
And as you said, the rewards is that each generation has a kind of a bias, a general bias. You grew up because of the, the school curriculum, because of the TV, because of the media environment, all that kind of stuff tends to form you with certain assumptions and that that'll be different from someone who's a generation or two ahead of you or behind you. So um, it's like traveling to a different country. It's the same reasons. You want to travel to meet people thinking slightly differently than you do, to kickstart the idea of having a different idea, be put out of your normal routine so that you can look at things in a fresh way, and hanging out with another generation above or behind you does almost the same thing. I feel like the internet and the kind of interest graph of places like Twitter is doing some of that because a lot of the time you see a name but you don't know all they are, what their credentials are. It's, it's more meritocratic, but there's still a limitation where exchanging a few texts once in a while is not the same as having a close friend or having a heart-to-heart -heart conversation over a scotch or whatever. Speaking of this, another great one that I love from the book is experiences overrated. Most astounding accomplishments were done by people doing them for the first time. And you, you talk about hire for attitude and attitude and then train for skills. And this is another one that I wish our civilization would realize because there's so much potential to unlock there. I was talking about a book recently about the early days of PayPal and all of the bankers on Wall Street were appalled that the management were all in their late 20s, right? They wanted to put a bunch of people with gray hair in them to make them look respectable. But it's like, they are the people who actually built the thing and they did it. It was the first time, but they figured it out. And this is another huge bias that I don't know how to address. It's really, really weird if you look back at the um, American Revolution, because all those founders were in their 20s. Hmm. Yes, great example. It's just shocking how young they were. And no wonder, <laughs> no wonder the king was very dubious that this was ever going to succeed because they were just a bunch of 20-year-olds who were very fiery and ambitious and they were going to change the world. Yeah, 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 sure, 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 sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you need to be a bit naive to try it, right? Exactly, right. You don't know. There's two things why the young keep inventing new things. One is because um, they don't know any better. They don't know how hard it is. They sometimes are ignorant of the fact that other people have tried and it didn't work, which is really common. But the second reason is, is because they're broke. And that's actually an advantage. That's another piece of advice is that the thing about people with money, billionaires and stuff, is that they tend to want to buy solutions to things. They want to use money to actually solve something. But if something can be solved with money, then all the big, rich corporations and people are going to solve them. But most Problems can't be solved with money. They need ingenuity. They need grit. They need persistence. They need innovation. And that's something that the young can have in abundance. And so the fact that you don't have money should ever, really ever be a hurdle. Indeed. And, and it turns out well that it works this way because otherwise all of the big companies would crush all of the startups and we wouldn't get some of that innovation. On grit, that's something that I see so often where people give up in the part of the exponential curve where it looks like nothing is happening and they don't get to the part where it takes off, right? And this is another thing I've been wondering with my kids, with others, is this perseverance? Is this something that can be taught? Is this something that can be in the culture? Is this intrinsic? I think it can be taught. Actually, I went to visit a school yesterday in Austin, Texas, which is really remarkable. They teach the core, what they call it, core curriculum, you know, like the fundamental stuff. But the teachers are not, not allowed to teach at all. They're prohibited from teaching. They can tell the students the sequence in which they have to learn it themselves. And they all learn it on apps and Khan Academy and everything. And so they are not allowed to teach them things. They can only teach them how to learn that lesson. And it makes them incredibly self-motivated and incredibly persistent in that sense because they can't ask the teacher for an answer. They always have to get it themselves. And they can't even ask the teacher how to do something. They can only ask the teacher how to find out how to do something. A friend of mine told me this anecdote about how and he has a great library, right? The yeah. walls full of books. And the kids came to him and asked him questions because the kids knew he knew the answer. Right, right. And he pointed to the book, said, look it up, find out for yourself, it's in there. And it's the teaching out to fish kind of thing, right? I, I, I love this. Rather than the books, they have all app-based thing, Khan Academy and these other things. And they measure everything. So they're measuring. So the teacher is actually just seeing 
how much they're doing, what, how they're doing it, and they're helping them that process of it rather than teaching them the knowledge. If growing up I had access to Google and YouTube, wow, it, my life would be totally different, right? Well, that's what these kids do, and they have Khan Academy and everything else, and that's what, that's what they're doing. So the answer is yes, they can be taught. Different topic, but kind of still with the age thing, right? Because this is a good vein. Uh, you, you talked about looking at demographics of the planet. We're, we're going in a direction where we're going to peak around probably 27E. And then there's so much inertia in the system that it's very hard to change quickly. And we're not finding good ways of changing it. So we're going to have to figure out a way to live with this new, in the modern world, unprecedented decline, right? We should still try to see if we can increase birth rates. But on the other end, It feels to me like the risk reward on a huge kind of Apple project on extending healthy lifespan, right? Health span of people would be another great way to help with this, mitigate this decline. And I don't understand why, maybe it's a blind spot of humanity because we're like, oh, well, it's, you live at this age, you get frailer and this is it. It feels like it's an evolutionary blind spot, right? Evolution just has never optimized for this part of our lives because we don't reproduce at that age, but maybe we could work in there more. I think there's tremendous work happening in longevity, and it's not being ignored at all. It's just that it's very, very, very difficult. My wife is in biotech. She works for 23andMe in the therapeutics division, and she worked at Genetech for 30 years. So there are plenty of people. It's just that it's very, very, very difficult. It's a very complex system. And so I see lots of attention, lots of money going there for the obvious reasons that people will easily pay particularly later in life when they have more money to extend their lives. And I don't see it a blind spot at all. It's, it's quite the contrary. I see a lot of attention given to it. The issue, the challenge is that it's really hard to do. And I'm a little skeptical about how far we can go. We just simply don't know. Or I should say, here's what it is. I think there's going to be a cost to it. Extending the life will not come free. There will be... That's just the rule of biology. Nothing is free. You always have to pay in some capacity. There's a trade-off. So what we don't know is what is the trade-off for having a really extended life, longevity? What is that trade-off? We don't even know that right now. And so that's how far away we are. But there's tremendous interest in this, and there's lots of money flowing into it. There would be more if there were more progress made, but it's just very slow progress. Yeah, that's a very good point. And and. Maybe it's a question of degrees, but when I look at how much brain power is going to, say, investment banking 10 years ago or big tech today, I'm thinking that there's underinvestment in, in talent in those fields. I know it's a question of, just as you say, it's so hard that when you show progress, there's going to be more. Maybe it's a question of other fields pay so much better that there's a kind of brain drain. But for the reward that humanity could get, it feels underinvested, even if we're still investing a lot. Well, that's because we tend to expect the market to fund things. Hmm. And the problem is, is there's not going to be a payoff in three years. Right. Hyperbolic discounting. So that's why there's no big investment. This has to be governmental thing, which is going to say, we won't see the benefits of this for another generation. And so if you really are serious about funding it, you have to be much more in favor of government funding because the market cannot possibly fund it. They're not going to get their money back for 10, 15 years. And the smart money is not willing to do that. So you have to say, no, we need a lot more government funding for science and R&D. And if you're willing to do that, then sure, then we can divert some of that to longevity. Right. That kind of goes back to the limited by vision and not by talent. And if Apollo project was kind of that, right? We kind of pulled the future forward because with 1960s technology going to the moon was at the very, very edge of what we could do. Right, right, right. And the natural order wouldn't have been that if the government wasn't pushing so hard, right? And the, the society's project wasn't there. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So what we need is we need an expanded vision of what the government can do and how government can be really great for us. And that's a big hurdle for a lot of people, particularly those entrepreneurs and others who want government to be minimized. So that's a big change in the political will is to want to have more government investment into technology. Because you have to decide. You suddenly have to have governmental technology policy and stuff. And so a lot of people are very allergic to that. And I think that's a mistake. Changing gear a bit to the creator economy, your essay, A Thousand True Fans, is basically trying what I'm trying to live right now on Substack. I'm curious if you think it's possible to... Because in any of these kind of creator economies, there's a huge power law 
where you know the top few people on YouTube make most of the money and then there's a very very long tail with people making 50 cents right i'm curious if there's a way changing incentives or something to flatten this distribution out a bit so that more people can earn a middle class living in there or is the solution kind of like to fractally go down into niches and be at the top of your power law but in your tiny corner of the world or i'm curious how you think about this kind of economy so Initially, the first time I wrote the Thousand True Fans, which the premise is, is that if you have direct contact with your fans and get the money from them directly, you need less number of fans. You don't need millions. You could maybe have thousands. That was in response to Chris Anderson, my colleagues at Wired, his long tail theory, which is that the aggregation of the long tail can exceed the value of the head of the hits. And I said, well, that's really great for the aggregators. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't help the individual contributors. And so I'm offering a different vision, which is that you stay in the niche, but you have direct contact with your fans. And so that in that long tail, you can make a living, not not make a fortune. So my answer is in part this you know, mass niches where you have uh, niches of a thousand Fans And one of the things that I kind of realized in writing it was that if your obsession or passion or interest would only appeal to one in a million people, it was so strange and weird that only one in a million people would really, really be interested in that. Well, with several billion people on the planet, that means that you still have a thousand people, a thousand potential people for every single weird niche thing, you can still find a thousand people. The issue is, how do you match them? How do they find you? How do you find them? And that's where we can have new tools and new technologies. And that might answer the, your question about bringing the niche forward, making it viable. We need better matchmaking and finding tools so that those thousand weirdos can find you and you can find those thousand weirdos. And social media was the beginning of, of doing that. And that's been very beneficial. That has really helped. But we need even better tools to do that kind of matchmaking. Yeah, that's one of the problems I'm seeing right now. It's discovery being this lighthouse, right? And you can attract your tribe to you. For a while, Facebook was great at driving traffic, and then they turned down the organic reach, and now you have to pay if you want to do anything, right? Even if people follow you as a media creator. And then Twitter was great. People found all kinds of links everywhere, but then they turned down the engagement on links. If you link out, your tweet's not going to be seen by many people. And I feel like every media property over time figures out that, well, we'd rather you just stay here rather than be linked out somewhere else and you may not come back. And so what's the discovery going to be in the future? For podcasts, this seems to be the hardest media to get discovered because right now it's kind of word of mouth and maybe some YouTube clips, but I'm curious if maybe this is something that AI can help with again, or I don't know where it's going, but it feels like discovery is being kind of turned down at every social platform. You're right. Discovery is the challenge. And I think AI will help like other things. There'll be ways to do it. And also we are kind of having to educate ourselves. We're still not sure about how much we want to be tracked in our own interests. And we, and we, you know, this whole, like, how customizable do you want your feed? How much do you want it to, to know about other things about your life? And sometimes we say, yes, we want people to find us and, and then to find us. But that might require us to kind of be more transparent. And so we have a dilemma about privacy and transparency. And the dilemma is, is that if you want maximum personalization, you have to be maximally transparent. If you want to have privacy, then you have to be opaque. Then you have to be generic. You have to be a generic thing. You'll be treated generically if you're totally private, right? Because nobody knows anything, anything about you. So you're just going to be another number. But if you want to be personalized, then you have to be transparent. So we're really conflicted about where we want to push it. And so far, I think we're going to push it in the direction of like maximum personalization, which means maximum transparency. But we're, we have to educate ourselves about that. We're saying, okay, if I really want to have personalization, have people find me and have discovery really work, everybody's going to have to be a lot more transparent about their general interests and stuff so we can find them. And that requires more transparency. And we're not really, that's going to take a while for us to get there. 
It's, yeah, it's a hard discussion to have because a lot of nuance is lost, right? It gets to be slogans where, oh, you're being tracked. People don't understand the quid pro quo that they're making when they're giving some of that data. Right. And so even this very simple thing, which is, do you want advertisements to be more personalized to you? At first, we say, yes, I don't want to see menstruation pad ads, or whatever. But then again, the problem, if they're really targeted to me, then then I'll be distracted. They're actually, well, I'll pay attention to them. <laughs> it works too well. It works too well. Right, exactly. Generic ads, easier for me to dismiss. So we don't even know the answer to that. It's like, do you want the ads you see to be really targeted to you or not? And we don't know. And it's fairly easy to imagine at this moment that in a few years, the ads will be like custom made by AI based on everything they know about you. And it could be a short video that's maximally engaging to you. And that could be very distracting. Right. It's like, do you want that? No, actually, I don't. <laughs> I'd rather have a generic ad that I can just ignore. Yeah, it feels, feels kind of dystopian. <laughs> We're almost out of time. But one more thing that you said that I, I noted, I wrote down because I loved it. It was kind of a mind expanding moment. You said, the main benefit of language is not for me to communicate with you. It's to have access to my own thoughts. And this immediately made me think about what language is AI going to think in? And if it's a weird, obscure, latent space machine language, Will it be forever kind of uh, out of reach to us? But also just the way humans use thought. Like any riff you can have on that, that I think that's super interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, I think the best framework for me to think about the AIs in plural, always plural, is that there are many different species and they're artificial aliens, right? They don't think like us. So I don't expect us to be able to access the inner thoughts, but we will use some AIs to oversee and examine other AIs to explain them. So we're going to have explaining AIs whose job it will be to go in to explain their AIs. And that is actually the beginning of consciousness. But isn't that kind of turtles all the way down in that? How do you, the first AI that helps you to, like, how do you make sure that the first AI really helps you and that you understand that one? That's what Douglas Hofstadter called the strange loop. It's a recursive loop. It's totally paradoxical. It's A is influenced by B, B is influenced by C, C influences A, right? So it's like, where do you start? There's no beginning, no end. So, so that strange loop, that recursive loop, is the central thing of consciousness. And that's what we're going to do with these AIs. In order to understand them and control them and manage them, we have to have a, build another AI that's meant to explain that, which will need another AI to explain that. And so you have this recursive loop of stuff that this is turtles all the way down. And that is, that's our own minds. That's how we work. We have these multiple, we have what Marvin Minsky called the society of minds. And we have some parts of our minds that are trying to access other parts. And that is the language mode. And that's one of the ways that we kind of surface our own minds is that we use language to kind of surface. So we have the language mode of our brains is helping us inspect our other parts. I think we'll recreate some of that kind of, of ecosystem of many, many minds, a society of minds, as we make these more complex. But they will never, ever, ever be like humans unless they're running on tissue like humans. One thing that's having its moment these days is chatbots. And the movie Her was kind of the example of where this could go. Right? There's a lot of human-like personality in it. But one thing I've been wondering about is, could there be a kind of chilling effect if these chatbots are super great, super compelling, have a lot of utility, right? So people want to keep using them. But then if you anger the chatbot, if you just playing around or by accident, you make it mad at you, right? And it has real personality and it has perfect recall forever. Is there a chilling effect in not wanting the bot to be mad at you forever? Is there a right to be forgotten or forgiven by AI? I kind of wonder I will play with this when these things have kind of artificial personalities. Well, yeah. So again, the, the idea that they're going to take over or have our control is silly. If bots behave in a way that we don't like, we'll use a different one. <laughs> you know, it's like there were no obligation. And there'll be many, many varieties. And then maybe there are some big monopolies because they have really good bots that learn really fast and they're cheap. And maybe they're mad at us. Well, then they will leave or we'll go somewhere else. There are already so many different personalities in these image generators, and some people prefer one over the other. So the thing about these is that they're not overlords. They're our assistant. And if your intern, your, your universal personal intern, is not is being mean to you or 
is disgracing you, whatever it is, you'll get a different one. I was kind of picturing as a private citizen, if like Google is mad at me, right? I don't have the power to change Google, right? So it depends if there's lots of competition and you, you can control those bots or if some there's kind of like monopoly situation where a few of them are huge, like the big tech of today, and you have these relationships with them, but they are kind of out of your control. So I guess it depends how it turns out. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's not impossible to think that Google could be mad at you for other reasons already. Today, there's things that people are, are complaining because Google's mad at them, right? They're saying you're spamming or whatever, or you're a bot. We already have that. And so your choice is like, well, you can use a different search engine. We have you.com. We have Neva, which I use. We have tons of alternatives. And so I think this idea that it will take over is a complete Hollywood myth. And the singularity itself is a, is a religious belief and not at all tied to reality. Hmm. Well, we're, we're out of time. I want to thank you very much for talking with me today. It's been amazing. I want to remind the listener about the book. It's called Excellent Advice for Living Wisdom. I wish I'd known earlier. It comes out on May 2nd, 2023. So around when this podcast is coming out, get a copy. I think you'll get a lot of thinking per page. I really am happy that you uh, like the book. And I do encourage people whether they're young or old, I think there's some advice. And for me, I really do wish I had known this earlier and put it into a little handle so that I could have repeated it. And I just want to close with my little bit, last piece of advice, which is um, your goal in life is to be able to say on the day before you die that you have fully become yourself. So what I hope for all people reading the book is that this helps them fully become themselves. That's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really been fun. You ask great questions. Thank you. I love that. Questions that haven't been asked before. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a high bar. I'm sure you've been asked lots of things. <laughs> that is, and that's really great. It's really fun. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye.